On a winter evening in Evansville, Indiana, a hardworking firefighter, husband, and father returned home to his wife after yet another long day. As the 51-year-old walked up his driveway towards his front door, he was struck from behind by multiple gunshots. Moments later, his wife came rushing from the home, calling 911 in a panic. She had been standing just inside making dinner by the kitchen window, a window only feet from the driveway. But she claimed not to see anything. She told detectives at the scene, I didn't intend for any of this to happen. Hi there, I'm Kevin and welcome to Just Thought Lounge. Today's case is a recent one. Although it is solved, I don't expect that we've seen the last of it. This is the story of an investigation launched on suspicions and coincidences. For those pursuing justice in this case, it was personal. And so in the end, there was no smoking gun, only a puzzle slowly put together piece by piece. Let's take a look. Evansville is the third largest city in Indiana. It sits on a picturesque bend on the Ohio River. In the city's sprawling residential neighborhoods, the pace of life is a bit slower and the sense of community is strong. The sun was just beginning to set on a mild night on Oakley Street. Elizabeth Dorr, Becky as she liked to be called, was cooking pork chops for dinner. Becky's husband, firefighter Robert, was due home at about 7 p.m. Robbie was a bit of a workaholic. His line of work meant that he regularly did 24-hour shifts at the station. He had been responding to emergencies and serving his community since the autumn of 1991. By the winter of 2019, he was approaching three decades of firefighting. That evening, Robbie had taken a half shift to cover for a colleague. It was just past seven and Becky listened for the sound of Robbie's truck pulling into the drive. From the kitchen window, she should have been able to glance out and see her husband as he emerged from the vehicle, carrying a lunch pail, thermos, and other work gear. Becky did hear the sounds of the truck's tires driving over the gravel as Robbie came home. The sound that rang out next, though, was unexpected. It was a popping noise, Becky said. Gunfire. I need, I need an ambulance. What's the address? I need no place. What's going on there? My husband just got shot. You said your husband just got shot? Yes. Stay on the line. I'll connect you to the ambulance service, okay? My dad's on the phone. Rob. Rob. I don't know. Your phone is popping. Please get somebody here. I don't. Rob. When police and firefighters arrived at the house, they found Robbie had been shot multiple times and was struggling to breathe. They also realized that they were fighting to save one of their own, to many a close friend. 
Despite the responders' best efforts, there was nothing that could be done. Robert Doerr passed away in his driveway before his friends were able to place him in an ambulance. 51-year-old Robbie Doerr had followed in his father's footsteps when he chose a career as a firefighter. Though it was his passion and his colleagues more like brothers than co-workers, there was a downside to the role. It did not always pay the bills. For 15 years, Robbie had worked a second job at Taco John's, and more recently, he had donated plasma to further supplement his income. After their wedding the year prior, Becky had stopped working, which no doubt added further pressure to the couple's financial situation. Robbie had one daughter, Lindsay Griffin, who had moved from home years before. She had two young children, Robbie's grandkids. The shock of her father's murder was crippling for Lindsay. It was also baffling. Her father was known as a kind-hearted and hard-working family man. It was inconceivable that he could have been targeted and to have been ambushed and then executed in front of his own home. To see an Evansville firefighter gunned down in front of his own home uh, is, is something that uh, we weren't really prepared for. Uh, the firefighters that had to respond to that scene and work on their brother, the police officers that arrived and quickly realized that it was a firefighter, uh, is just something that, that we don't see very often. Nearby residents reported hearing nothing suspicious before or after the shots were fired. No vehicles or people were seen fleeing from the scene. Becky had been home alone and had also reported seeing nothing. Detectives did not recover any spent shell casings at the scene, and the assailant had clearly fled the area quickly. For this reason, it was thought that the weapon could have been a revolver, which would have retained the spent casings. Robbie was shot in the shoulder and the head from the back. Multiple shots were fired, resulting in several projectiles entering neighboring homes, though no one else was injured. The mixture of ammunition recovered during the autopsy was unusual. The buckshot was of a small gauge, while the pistol ammunition was 45 caliber. Firearms manufacturer Taurus sells a revolver it called the Judge, which can fire both types of ammo. For this reason, investigators narrowed in on the judge as the potential murder weapon. FBI task force officers assisting the Evansville police searched across their sources for the revolver type, and they got a hit. A Taurus judge had been stolen roughly six months earlier from the River City Pawn Shop. That shop is only five miles from Oakley Street, less than a 15-minute drive from Robbie Doerr's house. It seemed likely that the gun came from that store, though who had used it to gun down Robbie Doerr was a more complicated question. The day following Robbie's murder, Becky Doerr turned up at the fire station. She wanted to inquire about her late husband's pension. As his widow, she was entitled to 75% of these funds for life, as well as a $12,000 death benefit. Colleagues of Robbie's were struggling with their own grief, the loss of a friend, and in such a violent manner. They also began to struggle to comprehend how his widow could be seeking her death benefit payout less than 12 hours after he died. On the evening of Monday, March 4th, roughly a week following the murder, and immediately after Robbie's funeral service concluded, Becky Dorr was asked to accompany Evansville police and the FBI to the station to answer a few follow-up questions. On the night of the shooting, she had told detectives on scene repeatedly and with certainty of her movements that day. She related to them who she had been in contact with and at what times. To verify her account, investigators received the data from Becky's cell phone, as well as toll records from Sprint, her cell phone provider. Comparing the calls that the widow said she had made that day to the Sprint records, police noticed an Evansville area code phone number had called Becky's device not long before the murder. The call had lasted just over four minutes. It did not appear on her cell phone call log nor had she reported it to police. The only explanation was that Becky had deleted the call after disconnecting at 6.51 p.m. Robbie was shot less than 10 minutes later. 
The investigators began by asking Becky to make notations beside each call on their log to record who each phone number belonged to. The widow was meticulous in her recollection of many details that day. The pork chops she prepared for dinner, her movements in the house, even the location and behavior of the dog. She did not, however, recall the four-minute phone conversation that she held only moments before her husband was killed. Whether you, I, or the other people that are in these rooms over here can change what happened. But you see, let me finish. Cannot change what happened. But you can change it from how it goes on here now by telling the truth. Do you understand what I'm saying? I do. Okay. So take a deep breath and tell us who you talked to five minutes before your husband was killed in your driveway, kicking out of his truck in the back of the head. We're asking questions we know the answers to, Becky. The investigators were not bluffing. A search of the phone number returned the name of a man known to Becky, Larry Richmond Sr. 46-year-old Larry was engaged to be married to Becky's sister, Amanda. He was also a convicted murderer. Larry had been previously sentenced to 45 years in prison for the shooting and killing of 70-year-old James Everett Montgomery in 1996. He had been released less than a year earlier. This is your fiance. The one you don't know much about, correct? And I don't know much about him. And what did you talk to him about? Well, he wanted to know um, if what Bob and I were doing this uh, time this weekend. So what did you talk to him about? And do not lie because we're telling you, answering your question, we already know the answer to. Right. We know his history. We know everything about him. I don't know what I don't know. I, I, I don't know what, I mean, I know what happened wrong in my driveway, but I don't know who did it. I, 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 don't, I don't know, I honestly don't know who did it. No thing about him calling until we pull it out of you. we pull it out of you. The only you keep it up, the worse it looks on you. And I didn't even tell anybody to hurt my husband. And tell us what happened. Tell us what happened. I have only met him a few times. But you had a five-minute conversation with him. Five he asked, he basically asked what we were up to. Does it all work this weekend? Becky's claim to not know Larry well enough to form an opinion of him, it seems, was just like the rest of her story, very unlikely to be truthful. Photos of the two together and with family showed that Larry and Becky had in fact spent quite a bit of time together socially. They even went on a double date. Then there were the phone records. The phone call on the night of the murder was not the only deleted call on Becky's phone. She often deleted calls from her device history, she said. Investigators found 28 additional calls present on the provider's records that had been cleared from her device. 15 of these calls, all in the previous two months, were with her sister's fiance. There were no text messages or other communication between the two located. Investigators could not prove what was said on the calls, and Becky continued to insist that she had nothing to do with her husband's death. But if there was nothing to hide, why delete the calls? Becky stated that she knew the phone calls would look bad. Perhaps it would appear as though she was having an affair. Talk that off for 40 minutes. For this young man, how many times? Getting more phone calls, getting more phone calls, getting more phone calls, every time you start to get nervous. Right? Because you knew we were coming to that phone call, right? I didn't want you to think that I was having an affair with him because I didn't have an affair. The phone call before the murder may not have indicated an affair. But detectives did in fact have reason to believe that Becky had been unfaithful to her husband. After searching the house on Oakley Street, they discovered a letter written by Robbie to his wife. It was stored in a drawer in the master bedroom. In it, he referred to her infidelity with lines such as, Ever since he came back into your life. And, I see his text messages on your phone. Who Robbie was referring to in this letter was not made clear. 
Becky was arrested and charged with obstruction of justice for the deletion of the phone call on the night of the murder, and for lying about it to police. She was released on bail, but the charges were later dropped. There was a more significant charge they were seeking to bring against Becky Dorr, though it would take some time to put together the missing pieces. With Becky subsequently released from her obstruction charges, police began conducting surveillance on her, Larry Sr., as well as Larry's son, Larry Richmond Jr. It seems that Larry Jr. had been an employee of the River City Pawn Shop during the period of time when the Taurus judge was removed from the store's inventory. Investigators had still been unable to recover the weapon, so they brought in Larry Jr. for questioning. Under threat of greater charges, the younger Larry folded quickly. He admitted that he had stolen the Taurus judge from the pawn shop. Larry Jr. handed over his cell phone, which contained a text message exchange with his father about the gun. He sent a photo of the silver revolver to Larry Sr., offering a trade. He told investigators that he gave that gun to his father at that time, just two days before Robbie Dorr was shot and killed. In August 2020, the elder Larry pleaded guilty to two counts of being a felon in possession of a firearm and two more counts of possessing a firearm with an obliterated serial number. He promptly went back to prison, having committed additional felonies only months after being released on parole. While the suspected gunman was held, detectives pursued a case against the second person they believed was responsible for Robbie's murder, his wife, Elizabeth Dorr. As the Evansville police moved forward, they called Becky to testify before a Vanderburg grand jury. Those proceedings are not public record. However, the day following Becky's testimony in July 2022, she was booked into county jail after officials claimed that she perjured herself. Just like her alleged accomplice, Becky would remain in custody as conspiracy and murder charges were filed. His death rocked this community as he had just finished his shift serving the citizens of Evansville as a firefighter, truly one of Evansville's bravest. Today is the first step in seeing some type of justice for Robbie. A short while ago, Larry Richmond Sr. and Elizabeth Fox Dorr were charged with the murder of Robbie. For over three years, EPD investigators, along with the FBI, the Vandenberg County Prosecutor's Office, and the Vandenberg County Cyber Crimes Task Force have been working tirelessly to get to where we are today. We are relieved that the long wait is over and the individuals involved in this murder are being brought to justice for not only Robbie's murder, but the pain they have caused his family, his friends, and our department. Thank you. The widow pleaded not guilty and prepared for trial, which commenced in the spring of 2024. Larry Sr.'s case was split from hers and was still pending. The evidence compiled against Becky remained spotty. The state argued that Becky had a financial motive to want her husband dead. They also argued that Becky had been engaged in an affair with Larry Sr., her sister's fiancé. Her desire to be with him was an additional motive to take out her husband. Robbie Dorr was gunned down in his own driveway by Larry Richmond Sr. I didn't intend for any of this to happen. This is what the defendant told detectives who were questioning her that night about the death of her husband. When Robbie Dorr arrived at his, at his home after work, he was ambushed by Larry Richmond, who lied in wait just feet from where Robbie Dorr pulled into his driveway. This puts him close to a window the defendant says she was standing near making a pork chop dinner. Just 15 minutes before Robbie Dorr was ambushed and killed, the defendant spoke with Larry Richmond Sr. on the phone for four minutes and 18 seconds. As soon as the defendant was finished talking to Larry Richmond Sr., she deleted that phone call. There will be no evidence that Becky Dorr had any conversation with anyone about killing anyone. That doesn't exist. That is a speculative, suppositional, grandiose suggestion to support a charge that should have never been filed. You will hear no evidence of Becky Dorr talking about getting a gun. 
you'll hear no evidence about a conversation with anyone that's plotting her husband's death. That evidence does not exist. One of Becky's adult sons, Nathaniel, took the stand for the prosecution. He told the jury that his mother was fixated on his stepfather's pension income. She spoke about it regularly, including on the night that he died. It was a conversation several times. It was almost, uh, we had a conversation about it daily and I got frustrated several times and I was like, mom, there are procedures we have to go through to get to that point. Perhaps the most curious detail of Nate's testimony was in relation to a note that he discovered tucked inside one of the sympathy cards left at Robbie's funeral. While going through the cards, he noticed a piece of paper fall out of the card from his Aunt Amanda and her fiancé, Larry. We need to talk, it stated. It was signed, Larry. Amanda had no recollection of this note and no knowledge that it had been placed inside their card. Can you read that out loud to the jury? We need to talk. There's a phone number and it says Larry. Can you read the phone number? 812-589-5238. Larry. This note is exactly how you remember it the night that you found it. Correct. The note in the sympathy card was one of two handwritten letters that the state presented as evidence of the conspiracy after the fact. The other note, verified by a handwriting expert, was passed to Becky while in custody and addressed to Barbie. In it, Larry Sr. wrote that the case against Becky was weak. He didn't believe she would go to trial as long as she stayed quiet. He told her not to take a plea deal. Ironically, a cellmate of Larry's in the county jail came forward not long afterwards claiming that he had admitted to the killing. Larry allegedly told his cellmate that he was having an affair with the firefighter's wife and had laid in wait at the man's home and shot him to death. This alleged confession was inadmissible at Becky's trial. Becky's defense hammered one of the lead detectives from the investigation over the lack of evidence. The detective testified that despite not uncovering the content of any communications between Becky Dorr and Larry Sr. about the murder, he believed that she was lying about it. I feel strong about the case, but I have doubts. I mean, well, no, I, you, can't, I can't be on the, the phone the phone conversation with him that night. The deleted you, phone. You, you, know. you, you, you have... Let's, let's, be, let's sort of get this out in the open. Yeah, absolutely. There was a phone conversation mm-hmm. that you asked Becky about at some point, correct? Correct. And, and you allege it's with Larry Richmond Sr., right? It is, yes. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Yes. You have no idea what they talk about, do you? No. And, and you know who initiated that call, don't you? He did. Who? Larry Richmond Sr. He did. Mm-hmm. In fact, in your investigation, you don't have any evidence that Becky Durr ever initiated a phone conversation of any kind with Larry Richmond Sr., correct? Correct. In fact, this idea that is floated that these two were lovers... You don't have any communication between the two of them that would suggest that, do you? Correct. So if there's been a representation that there's going to be proof beyond a reasonable doubt that Becky Dore and Larry Richmond Sr. were lovers, that evidence doesn't exist, does it? Correct. But that's where... May I speak? May I speak, sir? Okay, thank you. you. When we talked about doubt, that's what... Because I can't be... We can't get content from a phone conversation. That's right. why so I have to take her. Now, looking at everything that has come in, I don't believe her answer. That's where it, I felt strong. I feel strong about the case, but my doubt is I can't be, I can't listen to the phone conversation. People can delete text messages between the two. Right. And we can't prove they've, te- but they can discard them before we collect the phone. That, that happens all the time. It would be Larry Richmond Jr. that took the stand to tie the last pieces together. He told the jury about giving the stolen Judge Revolver to his father before the murder. He also spoke about the single encounter that he had with Becky Dorr, claiming that she met with his father in their vehicle. The two spoke briefly and kissed each other before parting ways. 
my father was in the driver's seat, she was in the passenger seat, and I was in the back seat. And did they have a conversation? I couldn't recall. I was on my phone. Okay, you weren't. If they did, you weren't listening. To yeah, them. I wasn't listening. And what happened? Did she exit the vehicle? Yes. And did anything happen before she got out of the car? They kissed. They kissed. Mm-hmm. That Larry Senior had been the gunman was well supported. Cell phone location data from his device placed him in the neighborhood near to the house on Oakley Street before and after the shooting. Investigators recovered more than 42,000 files from his iPhone, including 15 location hits in a 67-meter cluster surrounding Robbie's house. The location data also showed him driving away from the door residence after the shooting. His device was powered off between 6.52 p.m. immediately after the call with Becky until 7.14 p.m. At that time, Robbie had been shot. Larry was located at a gas station around the corner from the house, accessing a police scanner app on his iPhone. The call that he held with Becky was also promptly deleted. Elizabeth Dorr did not take the stand. The 12 jurors deliberated for about four hours before returning a verdict on both counts, murder and conspiracy to commit murder. We, the jury, find the defendant guilty of count one as charged in the information signed and dated the state. Verdict count two. We, the jury, find the defendant guilty of count two as charged in the information signed and dated the state. Does either side wish to have the verdict or the jury polled? State? No. Defense? I do not. Family comes together when you need them. Finally, justice has been served. Um, Dad can finally... Finally, rest. Um, I'm sorry, but he can finally sleep and finally be put to rest. Um, and the people that are uh, finally being held accountable for what they've done. Two of Becky's sons spoke at her sentencing hearing, though only one of them did so on her behalf. Nathaniel spoke passionately about the pain that her actions had caused the family and how she was now lost to them. When it was Becky's turn to speak, she took the opportunity to once again proclaim her innocence. And after a lengthy speech by her attorney, outlining what he saw as the injustice of the verdict, they declared their intention to file an appeal. Regardless what the verdict says, I am innocent of these crimes. I never asked anyone to harm or murder my husband. My world came crashing down on the night of February 26, 2019. I was in shock, devastated, lost, and I've never really been the same since. At the age of 52, Elizabeth Dorr was sentenced to 60 years in prison for murder and another 30 years for conspiracy. The terms are to be applied consecutively. For Robbie's daughter, Lindsay, the extended Dorr family, as well as Robbie's many firefighting brothers, it was the ending that they had hoped for. Though nothing, of course, would bring back the father, grandfather, and good friend. Now Robbie has completed his task. His duties are done. He has given his best. For our brother and friend, his last alive. He is going home. Elizabeth Dorr's sentencing was in mid-June 2024. Her attorneys are planning to vigorously fight the conviction. At the time of publication, Larry Richmond Sr.'s trial date is set for August 2024. Thanks so much for joining me, and a special thanks to Kate H. for joining our Members Lounge. I'm Kevin, this is Just Thought Lounge, and I'll see you in the next one. Newton got his back, yeah, the content that you need is cool.